Thank you very much, Amal, for that kind introduction. It's so nice to see all of you. And uh, since it has always been my favorite time of the week, uh, this uh, clinical meeting, because it's the time I used to have a free lunch siesta. And uh, today I have to watch all of you. If you all want to fall asleep, you are most welcome. But I hope this lecture will be interesting and uh, that you will like to stay up. So today I will be talking about some uh, basic theories of how we interpret chest x-rays. It's basically uh, targeted for the more junior doctors because uh, I think it's very important as uh, clinicians, be all of us being able to interpret x-rays to a certain degree with certain degree of confidence. But remember, no one is, a, no one is an expert when it comes to interpreting x-rays chest x-ray especially because uh, the chest if you take is a three-dimensional structure but it is represented on an x-ray as a two-dimensional image. So many structures that belong to so many systems will be superimposed on each other. So you have to train your eye to differentiate these structures and also to detect pathology. So I'm, I hope this will be a useful lecture for you and when we are interpreting chest x-rays we only have shades of grey. So you have to really uh, have some principles, some theories to guide you by. Uh, then uh, x-ray quality is like also the outcome of, an, of a chest x-ray would largely depend on patient factors like the compliance of the patient and the body habitus, then the skill of the radiographer itself because uh, uh, proper exposure depending on the size of the patient, has to, uh, exposure has to be changed, also positioning, all these things matter when we interpret the try to interpret the chest x-ray so like i said earlier it involves it has uh, uh, organs that belong to many systems so um, yeah so the standard x-ray that we do is the posture anterior anterior radiograph that where the patient is uh, standing and facing or the uh, or the anterior chest wall is touching the cassette cassette is where the film is kept so when that happens, the beam enters, the x-ray beam enters the patient posteriorly uh, and that is the standard view that we always look at. But there are in certain circumstances, if the patient cannot stand upright or if the patient is in an ICU setting where we use mobile x-rays, ICU or ward setting where we use mobile x-rays, then the image is anteroposterior. So the image is, the beam is entering the patient anteriorly and uh, the image will be, uh, the cassette will be kept posteriorly. Then we have uh, certain things called conventional x-rays, CR, DR systems. Just for working purposes, if you know that CR and DR, they have better quality, they give you better quality results. DR uses less radiation, but they are very expensive. That would be enough for the time being. You are, of course, we have CI Martelet, so all of you would have seen uh, CI images, where all they chose come and take photographs and uh, show us. And uh, ideally a conventional x-ray should be viewed at 6 feet, at a distance of 6 feet. Uh, so um, then uh, what I want to emphasize is lateral films, we are not uh, passionate about lateral films. Radiologists hate lateral films. We take lateral films when we detect some pathology in the PA film and we want to see where it is, we, we want to locate the pathology, then we sometimes use lateral films. But uh, if you all want to order lateral films and send it to us for reporting, we are very unhappy. Okay, so then there are certain viewing techniques. Some people like to view because now, like I said earlier, there are so many structures in this x-ray. So you have to not miss anything. You have to try not to miss anything. So when you are trying to do that, certain people like to view from center towards periphery so that you have your own checklist and you keep, you keep on ticking them. Uh, then there is this A, B, C, D, E approach which I of course don't try to even remember but there are certain structures that uh, the A, B, C, D, E would give you. So I'll just run through them briefly. So, give me a second. So when you say airway, you have to look at the trachea to see the position, the caliber, then the carina, uh, you know where the trachea bifurcates. Uh, talking about the carina, usually we like to see the carinal angle as this. It's just a working rule. We, if the carinal angle is this way, we are happy. If it is like this, it's widened. So these are simple things that as junior doctors or even as uh, anybody can just practice in the ward. If you see an x-ray, if it looks abnormal, just see if these things are there. 
then uh, we look at the bronchi, see if they are obstructed, see if their caliber is fine, if there is anything impinging on it. Then you look at the highlight. Again, we have very simple working rules as radiologists. That's what gets us by every day. So the hilum is made up of upper. Like if you take this this part of the hilum, the upper part of the hilum is made up by the upper lobe pulmonary veins, and the lower part is made by the lower lobe pulmonary arteries. So it has this kind of a bay-like appearance. It has to be a concave thing. And the lower lobe pulmonary artery usually is like your little finger held this way. So a crooked little finger and if your finger, if the finger is like tubby or abnormally swollen then you know this uh, artery is not quite right. So these are simple things and uh, they are very useful in day to day practice. Then uh, breathing, of course, you have to look at the lungs, whether they are adequately expanded, whether there are any pathology related to the lungs, and you have to look at the pleura. Pleura usually you don't see unless there is something, uh, either a pleural thickening or something filling the pleural space. That is how we, uh, sorry, we know that the pleura is there, otherwise you don't see the pleura. Then look at, you have to look at the heart. Uh, when you when you are looking at the heart, everybody knows how to check for cardiomegaly. I won't be telling you the details, but you know how to check cardiomegaly. Then you have to look at the borders as well, the shape of the heart. So roughly, this is a rough thing. But just remember, uh, if you take the chambers of the heart, the left atrium is the most posterior and the superior thing. So it has this. It it is like this. It has a uh, oval shaped chamber with a little appendage that bends forward. So when the left atrium enlarges, both this main chamber and the appendage enlarge. So this appendage is the part that forms the upper part of the left heart border. So if this appendage enlarges like in mitral stenosis, you will either see a straightening of the left heart border or a bulge. So you know this is what is going on and the carina will widen as well. Then if you take the right atrium, it forms in the entire right heart border. So uh, also as a rule, like one third of the heart should be on the right side of the midline and two thirds of the heart shadow should be on the left side of the midline. So if the right atrium enlarges, you will see the concentric enlargement causing the right heart border to move this way, move towards the right. Then the left heart border, we all know it's mainly made up by the, uh, made up of the left ventricle. So if the left ventricle enlarges, it will kind of uh, cause the apex of the heart to shift downwards and laterally. So you will have something, a big thing like a papaya in left heart failure. But say the right heart is the right ventricle is what makes the inferior border. So when the right ventricle enlarges, the apex is where the two ventricles come together. So the right ventricle will cause this apex to push upwards. So you will have something like a baby's boot or maybe a mango. Right, then uh, coming out to the D. D stands for diaphragm. That then you have to check for the outline to see if there is any diaphragmatic hernia, diaphragmatic eventration. Then also you have to look at the costophrenic angles, which of course give you another indication of the pleura. Mm, then everything else, like you have to look at the mediastinum, you have to look at the other structures, not just intrathoracic structures, but bones, soft tissues outside, which are outside, and lines and tubes, because they also will give you a lot of information then replaced valves, pacemakers, so many things to look for in a chest x-ray. But today my topic will mainly cover pulmonary parenchymal pathology and a few uh, uh, entities on how to detect which, which part of the mediastinum some disease is located. But I don't think we have time to go into all the details of, uh, details of many of the entities that can be interpreted in a chest x-ray because it is too wide actually. Uh, so. Yeah, this is kind of a model chest x-ray where it's a good exposure film, it's well expanded, patient is taking a big breath and it's well positioned. So in that kind of a film, see you can see the trachea, bronchi nicely outlined and see the, how the vascular markings are, see how the highlight are. Uh, so this is a very good, uh, this is a sample of a very good chest x-ray. Right. And this is to highlight to you the importance of a good inspiration. Let's say this is the same patient with an expiratory film and a well-inspired film. You can see that there is apparent cardiomegaly in the expiratory film. 
so whenever we get a chest x ray to interpret what we do do is we count the anterior ribs like if you have six anterior ribs before you see the hemidiaphragm like by the time you come to the hemidiaphragm then you know it's a well inspired film otherwise i would warn you not to go into uh, like the extent of uh, finding pathology in a poorly inspired film because the high lie look congested you might interpret it as heart failure uh, also the uh, lung low parts of the lungs could be hazy so you might even think there is any consolidation so that is some uh, place to be very wary of right then there are these hidden areas in a chest x ray hidden areas are like most of the pathologies in a chest x ray will be staring at you in the face but there are certain pathologies that you have to go actively looking especially the apices if the apices if you don't look for pathology you might even miss a fan coast tumor okay so this area you have to go apical pneumothorax you might miss this thing so you go actively and look at these things also the highlight the highlight are very untidy usually in a x ray because of too much vessels and structures that is overlapping there so our eyes tend to avoid that area so usually if there is any high peribronchial thickening or bronchic uh, tasis our eyes generally try to avoid looking there so you have to actively look at the highlight and see if the highlight angles are normal highlight sizes are normal densities are normal all these things you have to look then comes the heart retrocardiac area now i must tell you the heart lies very anteriorly in the chest cavity so because of that the anterior border of the heart is actually touching the anterior chest wall so there is no space for anything to happen in between these two so whatever if you see anything any shadows superimposed on the heart you can safely assume they are behind the heart so that's why we call this retrocardiac area then you have to look at the places outside the chest wall as well especially the intra diaphragmatic region specifically to you see the diaphragm is a dome shaped structure so when you look at this area you have to remember there is some lung tissue that you are looking at as well because uh, if the diaphragm is a dome shaped structure there will be some lung tissue coming anteriorly and posteriorly uh, below the level of the dome um, so if you look at this x ray i don't know if it's clear can you all see there's a subtle density over here i don't know if the x ray quality is good but you can see right so that uh, this uh, caused the radiologist to go for a uh, cross sectional imaging go for a cross sectional imaging and can you see the malignant mass here so like that these hidden areas play a very big role on uh, in interpretation of chest x ray right then i'm going to talk to you about a basic important sign in chest x ray that this is one of our golden rules we always live by this rule and uh, it's actually been a life saver for us see the silhouette sign the meaning of this is like it's a, it should, it's a misnomer it should actually be loss of silhouette sign so what happens is like when structures are imaged in chest x rays they are uh we only see the outlines we only see the silhouette not the outline we only see the silhouette but uh, if two structures are in the same anteroposterior plane and they are very close to each other we will not see this definition between the structures that is what is meant by this silhouette sign so uh, let's assume if you are see, seeing structures if uh, you do not see the outline between the two structures now if you look at this image you can see the you can see some shadows in the lungs low part of the lungs lung left lung which is superimposed on this heart shadow uh, but you could still see the heart shadow through it okay so this is uh, not silhouetting but uh, this we just say it's not silhouetting it's wrong english but it's how we say it Uh, and then if you come to this image you can see there's some shagginess here and the heart border is not visualized so this is a positive one so now i'm going to show you how it applies in real practice can you see now here there's haziness or consolidation in the lower part of the lower zone of the left lung and you can't see the heart border through it so now this is an instant where we would like to go now look at lung in three dimension if you think of the lung in 3d uh, the if you think of the lateral image i hope you all know that the oblique fissure uh, comes forward uh, <laughs> 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 
ஒரு <laughs> and anything in front of the oblique fissure belongs to the upper lobe so in the left lung the lowermost part is called uh, the lowermost part of the upper lobe is called the lingula so this is lingula consolidation that's how we like even by looking at only the uh, frontal chest x ray we can say this is lingula consolidation yeah now if you look at this film Uh, sorry about the size but if you look at this film you still see the haziness the consolidation in the lower zone but you can still see the hard border so this is a negative silver sign and then we know that now what is uh, touching the we know anatomically what is touching the left hard border is the lingula of the uh, left lung but uh, since the hard border is not silvered we if we do the lateral film we can see uh, like i told you earlier everything behind the oblique fissure belongs to lower lobe so it's not silvered in the heart so it's the apical segments of the left lower lobe that is consolidated okay then uh, a few more things about the, the basic terminology that we use uh, in chest x ray interpretation if we say consolidation oops i'm sorry i think i pressed something accidentally did i go to the end meeting it sorry okay thank you so when we say consolidation that is some material either pus or blood or exudate something is filling the alveoli so alveoli are the terminal parts of the, the lung tissue when the alveoli are filled it's just filling the alveoli it's not making any volume changes so uh, with consolidation usually the bronchi the bronchial tree remains patent that is there is air within the bronchial tree so when you are looking at a, looking at that in an x ray you will see whiteness all over that is because of the uh, material that is filling the alveoli but you will still see the black lines through it which are the bronchi and the small uh, major and uh, smaller bronchi but uh, like i said because it does not cause any changes in volume the fissures and the lung size will not alter okay so if i am to take you to consolidation this is an example of consolidation if you can see uh, this area is uh, showing some uh, haziness this is this we call opacification with linear black things within it which are the patent bronchi so this has not caused any change in volume so this is a consolidation and uh, then uh, if you are talking about masses and nodules nodules are smaller mass we say when it's bigger there are certain rules that we go by and then uh, there are so many di differentials for masses and nodules this is just a uh, rough outline where we call a lesion which is smaller than 3 cm a nodule and a uh, lesion larger than 3 cm is a mass then there are different dds for single mass single nodule multiple masses multiple nodules so i will not go into details because this will be a uh, different major topic in itself then we have the interstitium of the lung so what we mean by the interstitium is uh, lung tissue like any other tissue in the body has this lattice like supporting network this lattice is uh, holding the lung parenchyma in place and it is <coughs> largely responsible for the elasticity of the lung so the interstitium i hope you can see there are it, Uh, depicted in this as fine lines it's a fine network of uh, lines that you see so this interstitial diseases are a separate entity uh, which encompass a large number of diseases and um, uh, i will show you how it looks usually when you look at a chest x ray lung markings the vascular markings and stuff don't usually traverse the entire uh, span of the lung they just end somewhere by about the Uh, middle one middle two thirds of the lung 
uh, like the inner two thirds would have ma enough lung markings, but the outer one third would be fairly free of lung markings. But if you see any linear shadows that are more towards the periphery and the bases, then you should wonder whether this patient could be having some interstitial disease. So this is just an enlarged view of that, uh, where you can can you see these reticular shadows? We call them reticular shadows. Uh, that's when we try to like to do HRCTs to see if there's any interstitial pathology. Okay, so then finally, I'm going to talk about atelectasis. The word atelectasis is synonymous with collapse, but uh, since it sounds nicer, we always write atelectasis instead of collapse. And uh, different parts of the lung can, like a lung can totally collapse, or different parts could collapse because they like to function as separate entities anatomically. Sometimes different because they have different bronchial uh, connections, they sometimes uh, collapse separately. So, we are going to look at a few images of atelectasis. Like this is a very famous, um, very typical uh, x ray of atelectasis. If you can see, can you all see the triangular shaped retrocardiac lesion? Uh, oh, uh, before I speak about atelectasis, I want to say how to differentiate consolidation from atelectasis. Is consolidation, I like I told you earlier does not change the volume of the affected lung. But atelectasis is when there is no air within the uh, alveoli, nothing within the alveoli, actually they just they just collapse. So because of that, there won't be any air bronchogram and the volume will be reduced. And it will sort of drag in whatever is adjacent to that as well because the, the diaphragm will be drawn in, the mediastinum might be shifted to the same side because there is significant loss of volume. So here you see a triangular density behind the heart, retrocardiac area. So, this is a typical way we see uh, left lower lobe atelectasis. Then uh, this one, uh, you all can, I hope you all can see, this is the right upper zone. You see this uh, uh, opacity without any air bronchogram in the right upper zone. And if you look carefully, you can also see that there is this curvilinear line. This is of course the horizontal fissure which we would have expected to be somewhere here being drawn up. So, this is right upper lobe collapse. And uh, this is a variant of right upper lobe, not, not a variant, another example of right upper lobe collapse actually. But if you look at this one, you will see that the uh, horizontal fissure comes nicely curving like this. Then you see a little bulge close to the hilum. So, this sign is called the golden S sign, uh, not because of any value of this sign itself, but because of the person who found it. His name is Golden and he has identified that if you have a hilar mass that is causing the uh, causing bronchial obstruction with secondary upper lobe collapse, you might just be able to see this mass like a reverse S. So, this is Golden S sign. When we see this, we know this is malignant. Then, okay, this is the right heart border. Now, if you remember the heart shadow, the heart borders have to be very sharp. But you see a triangle like area here. So, on the right side, you s uh, don't see the heart outline. So, if you use your silhouette sign, then you know the what is silhouetting the right heart border that is immediately adjacent to the same plane as the right heart border is the right middle lobe. So, when the right middle lobe collapses, this is what you see. Sometimes it may not be this clear as well. Sometimes you just see vascular crowding, but I didn't take complicated films here. Then, of course, um, you have the right lower lobe. Okay, the right lower lobe when it collapses, it will rarely give this typical appearance and uh, most of the time it will be like this or just vascular crowding in this area. These are subtle, these, are, these may be missed easily, but just if you have seen this once or twice, you might remember, it might ring a bell sometimes. And then um, this is a tricky x-ray. If you can appreciate that the density of these two sides is different and uh, this side shows, the left side shows a whale like opacification, we, this is the terminology we use, there is whale like opacification of the left, low, left lung. Also if you uh, uh, notice this, usually the left hemidiaphragm is lower than the right hemidiaphragm. But in this case they have come to an equal level. So this happens because there is some volume loss in the left side. Uh, also there is another interesting sign where you if you can appreciate this crescent of lucency that is surrounding the aortic knuckle, you can see that, can't you? So, this is the typical x-ray appearance of left upper lobe collapse. Like all this time when we were looking at collapse, we saw the collapsed lung tissue. But here you do not see the collapsed lung tissue, you see some indirect signs only. 
which this sign we call the Lufthischer sign. I'll explain it to you. Like what happens in left upper lobe collapses? If you look at this lateral film, you see the oblique fissure should have been like this. But when this is collapsing, the fissure is drawn this way because at the hilum it's fixed. So the fissure is drawn this way at the top and this way at the bottom. What happens is when the fissure is drawn this way, what is attached to the posterior aspect of the fissure is the lower lobe. The lower lobe is also getting pulled up. So the lower lobe is kind of hyperinflated and it's more looser than it should be. So what happens is when you look at it from this side, you see the as the, uh, you see this upper area being more loosened than the lower area. That's why the whale like opacity is not very homogeneous. Then this loosened crescent is made up by uh, the expanded upper uh, lower lobe. Okay, I hope I'm clear. If I'm too fast, just let me know. Uh, I would like you all to sort of uh, register this very well because these are very interesting and uh, it might save the day for you even at your like peripheral practices wherever you go. Sometimes you might make a brilliant diagnosis and it will be a very good thing. Okay, so then I'm going to talk about uh, the presence of some abnormal stuff. Mainly I'm concentrating on the emergency and acute presentations that you might uh, come across when you're alone. That's what I wanted to cons uh, concentrate here where you don't have time for a second opinion where you need to act quickly. So AR usually should be within the lung and nowhere else and of course the bronchial tree. But uh, abnormal AR could be within the chest cavity, outside the chest cavity, uh, within the lung itself even. So this of course you won't miss. This is a pure and simple pneumothorax. You see the collapsed lung tissue here and no lung markings. That's what we look for. We don't look for the lucency actually. We don't look for the blackness. We look for the absence of lung markings. Always when you are looking for pneumothorax, look for the absence of lung markings. Go along the lung tissue and until you meet the lung edge or the absence. Yes, so this is a pure and simple pneumothorax, but uh, th that was a PA film, an erect film, but pneumothorax in the supine film is more subtle and they say that approximately 30% could be missed. So this is very important because we do uh, need to exclude pneumothorax in trauma patients most of the time and they are mostly supine. So that is a very uh, significant loss if we miss 30% of pneumothorax in supine films. Uh, so we have this deep sulcus sign. We radiologists always have lifesavers. We have the deep sulcus sign which we go by in supine films. So if you can appreciate these two lungs look a little bit different in, in that this diaphragm is nice here but I am sorry about the loss of the low, low most part. But if you look at this uh, costa freak angle it is deep and it goes way beyond this one. So this is the positive deep sulcus sign where in the supine film you see one costophrenic angle being very very deep. So here of course you can see the lung edge if you look very carefully. If you can look somewhere here you can see the lung edge even. Okay. Mm. Then also tension pneumothorax you need to be able to say whether there is tension or not. You can't just say pneumothorax because uh, tension in itself implies what it is. Then there will be shifting of the mediastinum and also importantly flattening of the diaphragm, uh, shifting of the mediastinum and the trachea. So those things you have to look for, especially in the setting of trauma where there is a flyal chest or if there is some fistula uh, or valve effect where the, when the patient breathes in, more air gets sucked in and it gets trapped in. Then uh, also a pitfall that uh, we usually have to deal with. Uh, this is this happens usually in neonates and also in weak patients undergoing supine films most of the time where like weak old elderly patients where they have loose skin most of the time so if there is a loose skin fold that is pressing between the pressed between the cassette and the patient's back uh, it could sort of it could trap a column of air uh, deep to it so that could give you a false impression of a lung edge so if you see these things there are two things to remember just go looking for the lung markings. So you see lung markings beyond that. So then you can be sure, okay, this is not a pneumothorax. Also trace this line. And if you look carefully, you can see this line going beyond the confines of the lung. So that is some outside thing. Those are like subtle points. Sometimes we also make mistakes. But these are points that we go by to minimize our mistakes. Minimize overcalling. Then air trapping, of course, is usually in kids, usually in little children due to uh, aspiration or uh, foreign body uh, getting foreign bodies getting trapped. 
so what that hap- when that happens there's too much air in the lung like uh, say this child has something stuck in the bronchus so uh, when the child breathes in inspiration the bronchus is a little bit expanded so there's a little bit of uh, space between the foreign body and the wall of the bronchus that can let air in but when the child tries to exhale when the intrathoracic pressure goes up that little ga- that little width is reduced so this acts like a one way valve and air gets trapped so what will happen is you see a la- more expanded and a more translucent a darker lung okay if you see it to the, if the lungs are like if the patient is nicely positioned if the rib, le- rib lengths are equal if it is a well non rotated film you can safely say there is air trapping if it is a rotated film this all changes that uh, of course uh, gives you a false sense of air trapping and then the air could be uh, elsewhere like not in the pleural space not uh, trapped inside the lung but you can have air within the mediastinum if you can appreciate can you appreciate these mediastinal lines being outlined with uh, fine li- fine translucent lines this is how a subtle media me- pneumomediastinum could look so this is also important in the sometimes this could be spontaneous so sometimes arthrogenic all sorts of things can cause uh, pneumomediastinum so this is how we identify pneumomediastinum also there's another sign of pneumomediastinum which is not shown here if the lower part of the mediastinum is involved you might see a continuous diaphragm sign i'm sorry i couldn't get an image but the diaphragmatic outline will go like this usually remember in a normal x-ray you can't see the diaphragmatic outline at the level of the heart because the heart is silhouetting actually but uh, in pneumomediastinum you could and uh, pneumomediastinum in little kids in infants has a special appearance because of the presence of the thymus so this is a thymus gland and any of you who have seen an angel would know that the angel's wings are like this hmm? they are high arched so see the uh, little kids uh, thymus is outlined and lifted up just like the angel wings so we just say we just call this the angel wing sign we always have very like nice names and nice signs because we for tend to forget otherwise and uh, of course this is uh, air outside the thoracic cavity all of you house officers must have seen these things in your day to day practice this is surgical emphysema we also call it subcutaneous emphysema and in this patient of course has concurrent pneumomediastinum as well then of course like i said earlier the hidden areas are very important air can be in abnormal places sometimes outside the uh, thoracic cavity so you do see this don't you the air under the diaphragm so this could be a post surgical patient or maybe some uh, abdominal problem with a rupture of a viscus sometimes this air under the diaphragm can be so extensive you can have so much of air that you might even think this is just an atelectatic band you see this is actually the hemi diaphragm but even looking at this if it wasn't labeled even i would have thought this is just an atelectatic at- band but uh, that's because this patient has so much air under the diaphragm okay hi right. then talking about fluid abnormal fluid usually it's filled in the pleural space and uh, just know that if you see this much of fluid in the chest x ray the patient could have 200 to 300 ml of fluid in the pleural space and here if you see like it reaching half way of the thorax then it's like 2 liters and a full house would mean 5 liters so just remember this rough guideline and uh, one i'm not going to show you pleural effusion but i what i wanted to emphasize here is say you see a big pleural effusion sizable pleural effusion you can see always pleural effusions have tend to have this i'm sorry uh, this meniscus upward meniscus you all know this like a crescent shape if it is a pure and simple uh, pleural effusion and if a patient has a sizable pleural effusion but uh, just know if you know the laws of archimedes you know that if something is occupying some space something else has to be pushed so such a lot of pleural fluid has to push something away so it has to push the mediastinum mediastinum is the most mobile thing you have to be able to push the mediastinum away but in this case the mediastinum is not pushed it's central then you have to understand something else is being compromised so there has to be underlying collapse so mostly what happens with a large pleural effusion and underlying lung has to be collapsed then uh, you have to suspect malignancy and go for cross sectional imaging you won't be disappointed most of the time 
then also uh, still we are in plural effusion I wanted to tell you I told you earlier that plural effusions always have a meniscus like shape but say if you have a flat plural effusion then that loss of surface tension are disrupted here so then remember there has to be something that is not visible but something that is causing pressure from uh, on the plural effusion from above so this even if you don't see the lung edge you can safely assume this is a hydropneumothorax so hydropneumothorax will always have a flat upper surface of the pleural effusion but in this case of course you will see the lung edge mm, yeah if you look here i hope you can see the lung edge can be seen here is it is enlarged here you see the lung edge can you see the blue arrow pointing to the lung edge then also vanishing tumors sometimes when patients have uh, fluid in their pleural space sometimes the fluid can get entrapped in the fissures as well because the fissures are in continuity with the peripheral pleural surface this is what we call the vanishing tumor sometimes you see it one day you don't see it the next day so this looks very much like a mass or lung thing but when you do the lateral film you see that is fluid entrapped in the horizontal fissure likewise you can have fluid entrapped in the oblique fissure less, less often because this is of course very flat horizontal you can have this easily but it can get drained by itself so the next day you might not see it even right then I am going to show you a few miscellaneous x-rays because I think whatever I told you now uh, to be retained I have to limit what I am going to say like if I say too many things nothing will get retained so uh, these are few interesting x-rays that uh, uh, now when we look at the chest x-rays I told you it's not just the lung say you might see rib erosions now you see a mass here you may wonder which kind of which tissue this is originating from but I don't know if it is clear but if you carefully go through the ribs you have to look at each of the ribs and when you look at the anterior ribs you see that this anterior rib is destroyed uh, this is not very I don't think from far away you can see it clearly but when you look at it close you see that one anterior rib is destroyed so that rib destroyed with this adjacent mass then it's a rib lesion and uh, these other structures that are in the uh, thoracic cavity which are usually which usually are overlooked but when they are really pathologically uh, abnormal you see then this is an image of achalasia where the esophagus has dilated to this much this level and you have see food residue this is this mottled lucency is usually due to food residue mixing up with the uh, gas in any kind of uh, hollow viscous you see this in abdominal x-rays most of the time when you look at uh, obstructed bowel and all and this kind of x-rays tell you a story even if, you, if this x-ray comes without the history we can just say now we see multiple a cannonball metastasis bilaterally in the lungs then when you look carefully you can see the breast here but you don't see the breast here so you know the patient has undergone a mastectomy and she is now coming with recurrence so that in itself tells you the whole history again this one like in the correct clinical setting now this kind of x-ray would need the uh, history would have to come with the history because uh, uh, like the rule I told you about the little finger now you see this little finger is very much swollen and uh, with that when you see this wedge shaped consolidation this is in the correct clinical setting if you are told that this is maybe a postpartum mother coming with shortness of breath and tachycardia or any similar history we know this is pulmonary embolism the embolus is sitting in this artery making it denser and bigger and then you have the Hampton's hump we, we have certain names this is a area of uh, infarcted lung tissue ok so these kind of x-rays do need good correlation with the clinicians to diagnose then of course I am going to briefly touch on mediastinum still I think the silver uh, sign is the golden rule of reading chest x-rays uh, like I said when you see this widening of the mediastinum now ne you need to sort of have a rough idea about where this could be so when the upper hard border is not seen and the structures of the anterior mediastinum are not separately identified you know this has to be sitting in the anterior mediastinum which is also called the superior mediastinum and you do a lateral to confirm there is this there has to be a clear space we call this the retrosternal clear space which has to look like this so it's lost here so you know this mass is sitting in the anterior mediastinum usually in lymphoma we see this and then 
you see another mass here in the retrocardiac region. Like I told you earlier, heart sits very anteriorly in the uh, thoracic cavity. So you have to know that this is behind the heart. So then it belongs to the posterior mediastinum. So it's very easy once you sort of get the hang of it, it's very easy to depict where things could be. But not always easy when you get uh, x-rays in the practice. So if you do a cross-sectional imaging, you see this some schwannoma or something this was uh, sitting in the posterior mediastinum. Then uh, one final sign that we always use is the hilar movile sign. This is also derived from the silver sign itself. Uh, say this is the hilum, imagine this is the, your hilum and you see some density but still with the, this is the density okay the, the big thing within that density if you see the hyla vessels if you see the hyla vessels through that density you can safely assume this density is either anterior or posterior to the hilum by at least one centimeter this is again the silhouette uh, rule that rule that's applying here you see a density at the hilum but you can't see the hyla vessels through it. So this is at the hilum. This is a hyla mass. So here I hope you see that this is this hilum there's a hyla mass there's a mass at the hilum, but you can't see the hyla vessels separately. So there the silver sign is positive and this is a hyla mass. But here you see a mass again, but if you look carefully, you see the hyla vessels through it. So this is either anterior or posterior to the hilum. I didn't check the lateral x I don't know but it's either anterior or posterior. Okay. So then finally I would like to say reporting of chest x-rays usually we need good clinical information. Like we've had so many requests coming maybe not here but you know uh, some HOs like to write nice uh, referral letters they usually write their clinicians uh, credentials and name and everything and then our name credentials and dear madam sir please be kind enough to report this chest x-ray thank you and another seal that is not helpful and it takes up space we are in a crisis area era so we need to uh, save paper we would like to write on the back of the x-ray request itself so leave space give the relevant clinical history by that i would mean like we don't need uh, like just 38 year old male would do okay without all the uh, uh, like you know the niceties then age gender would matter very much because pathology is changed then relevant some relevant clinical history about the presentation also whatever positives and negatives you have found in examination and investigations it's simple we would very much value that because it makes our life much easier but remember x-rays are not always conclusive we might make mistakes you might uh, find other things uh, that things other than what we say so no one's a uh, expert when it comes to reading chest x-rays. No one ever will be. But as you go along, you can minimize errors. That's what's very important. And uh, I would like to finish showing you the hand x-ray of Bertha Ronjan, Mrs. Ronjan, who's this is the first x-ray in the world after uh, her husband discovered uh, x-rays. This x-ray was taken. And I think he imaged her hand so many times. And up until today, I was also under the impression that she died of a cancer because of this overexposure. But today I learned that she died at the ripe old age of 80 due to some renal issue. So that was not true. But so that means life may be not as fragile as we think. But when you order x-rays, when you order CTs, always consider uh, because they are ionizing radiation. Certain parts of the body will accumulate the dose and uh, we can have changes. We call it cumulative dose like in the eye. Uh, you can get cataract if you have repeated exposure so before ordering x-rays always be very careful and uh, correlate with the radiological team because uh, we are there to help you we are not adversaries we are adversaries we are there to help you so um, i hope you all got something out of this thank you any questions i'd like to answer but I would like to uh, just give me it. how I would like to I'll take one x-ray and show you how coarctation would look 
if we go to our model x-ray so coarctation would usually the coarctation usually happens before the subclavian artery on the left so the arch would show a reverse 3 appearance sorry the arch would show a reverse 3 appearance it's very sort of uh, well seen if you look at it carefully but it, it is another thing that you have to go actively looking also all these ribs would have notching in the inferior border where there are collaterals because in coarctation what happens is because of the proximal obstruction there will be collaterals forming so most of the ribs will show inferior little indentations we call them rib notching so that is how we usually identify and also there might be pre stenotic and post stenotic enlargement of the aorta so you will easily see that three sign the th three kind of appearance So in the absence of any further questions, I would, uh, I would assume this is done.